Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to see everybody again, and uh, again, you've all had your break, and you've had your coffee, and for those of you out in television, we just trust that you'll continue studying with us, and we appreciate your letters, your encouragement. My, I think I mentioned in the last program, we've had several letters in the last few days that just make it all worthwhile. Uh, we wouldn't need a dime of compensation. That would do it by itself. And uh, this fellow says, you know, all of a sudden, the Lord opened my eyes. He's only been watching about three months. And he says, I try to take it back and share it with my church people. But he said, lest they don't have a clue because they've only been in church 40 years. <laughs> well, isn't that so typical, you know? And uh, the longer they're steeped in some of those things, the harder it is for them to see it. But uh, we do. We just praise the Lord that he's uh, been touching the hearts and lives for so many. Okay, for those of us now in the studio and those of you in television, we will jump all the way up to Isaiah 24 on this half hour. A lot of these intervening chapters have just been God's prophetic judgment on the nations around Israel, on uh, Babylon and Syria and so on and so forth. So I think you can pick that up on your own reading time. But now I'm going to jump up to Isaiah 24, verse 1, where the prophet now leaps definitely to the time of the tribulation. Not the Babylonian invasion of 606, not 70 A.D., but this is the final wrath of God, the tribulation that will bring the planet to the end of time as we know it, and ushering in then the second coming and that glorious kingdom. But before the kingdom can come in, we have to have the judgment and the chastisement. All right, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 1. Behold the Lord. Now remember the word Lord in the Old Testament is God the Son, Jehovah. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty. Now we're talking about the whole earth. We're not talking about the land of Israel. And he maketh it waste and turneth it upside down, scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be as with the people the ordinary run of the mill, so with the priest. As with the servant, so his master. As with the maid and her mistress. With the buyer, the seller, the lender, the borrower. In other words, no one is going to be exempt from this outpouring of God's wrath. Verse 3, the land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken. Now here I think the word land is referring to the nation of Israel. It's going to be the vortex of all of this coming wrath and judgment. All right, the land shall be utterly emptied, utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken. Now we come to the whole planet, verse 4. The earth, all of it, mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away, the haughty people of the earth do lie. In other words, the super, super rich are not going to be able to escape it with their money. They can build enclaves and they can build places where they think they are totally safe, but it'll never work. They're all going to come under God's judgment. Verse 5, the earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Now, we got to remember that 700 B.C., the world's population was just a smattering compared to what it is today. See, even at the time of Christ, there were probably not more than 500 million or a half a billion people on the planet. And here we're now rushing towards 7 billion. We're somewhere between 6.5 and, and 7. And so we've got a mass of population tonight that even the prophet knew nothing of. But it's all going to come under God's wrath and under the defilement of the inhabitants because they have transgressed the law. Now, I think I'm fair in my assessment. What tonight 
today is ravaging the world like no other plague above everything else, AIDS. AIDS is ravaging the world. And it's something that they can't find a vaccine for, they can't find a real cure for, and uh, everything they're trying to do to stop the increase is seemingly falling apart. And so I think this is just one of the many aspects of this final world scenario of how the inhabitants have defiled the planet. All right? They have transgressed the laws. They have changed the ordinance. They have broken the everlasting covenant. In other words, they have totally rebelled against God and everything that God has said. Now, I just noticed in one of the news magazines I was reading last night that a new group was formed, I think in New York City, and they said, everybody else has a political action committee. We need one for ourselves. Did any of you see it? And they called them the Committee for Anti-God Americans, or something like that. And they are composed of those who are totally anti-God. They hate God and make no apology for it. Well, this is all just feeding the frenzy of ungodliness in the world tonight. All right, now verse 6. Therefore, because of this total rebellion of mankind in general and others in particular against God and His righteousness, therefore has the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Now, this isn't pretty language. I know it isn't. But the world is asking for it. They should know better. You know, every time I see all of this ungodliness coming out and how they're promoting it and how they hate the Christian view of life, I always have to think of this statement of Scripture, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Never forget that. That's easy enough to memorize. Righteousness exalteth a nation. Sin is a reproach for any people. And all oh, the world is just blatantly scoffing at that. They don't want righteousness. They don't want anything that's decent. All they want is that which satisfies the flesh. So it's coming. The curse is going to devour the earth, and the inhabitants of the earth are burned now, what does that smack of? I think nuclear holocaust. I have never worried about nuclear bombs being exploded over these last 40, 50 years. It just never bothered me. I've tried to teach in my classes, don't worry about a nuclear holocaust. I don't think God is going to let it happen. Now, with the terrorist activity, it may happen in an isolated place. But I don't think any one nation is going to start a nuclear war. It would be folly because it's just going to trigger everything else. So I feel that God will never permit it until the tribulation. And when we come to these final months of these horrible seven years, yes, I think a nuclear holocaust is going to erupt and every nation on the planet is going to start releasing them. And consequently, we have the term then that the inhabitants of the earth are burned because we know nuclear is intense heat. But in spite of the horrors that's going to take place around the planet, the encouraging words are here, there will be a few men left. Now, what does that mean? Well, there'll be some survivors. There always are. I've taught this over the years. Whenever you have a humongous earthquake, or you have a volcano erupt, or you have any of these global disasters, there's always survivors. And they're hard to believe that they've survived, but they did. Well, it's going to be the same way here, and I think it'll be all around the planet, from every nation around the world. After this Holocaust has come to an end, there's going to be some survivors. Now, you've got to remember that the 144,000 Jewish men have been circling the globe now for nearly seven years, preaching salvation, not based on our gospel of grace, but based on 
the gospel of the kingdom as Jesus and the twelve preached it, and it will bring salvation to those that believe. Now, in order to, to uh, confirm that, you can come with me now to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, which is a tribulation chapter. And it's in response to the question of the twelve, what shall be the signs of the end in your coming? Matthew 24. Let's look at verse 3 first, honey. Matthew 24, verse 3. Now remember, this is in Christ's earthly ministry, toward the end of it, of course, but the twelve are still intact. So as, verse 3, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples, the twelve, they came unto him privately, saying, that is, without the press of any crowds, and they said, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the ages? And then Jesus answered and said, and he begins to unfold the events opening up those final seven years. And they're in perfect parallel with the seal judgments of Revelation chapter 6. Now, I'm going to go take time to uh, compare those right now, but you can do that on your own, that the six seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6 come right down the pipe like Jesus unfolds it here in Matthew 24. But here's the verse I want you to see. Verse 14. Lock this into your computer. And this, that is the one that he and the twelve have been preaching now for three years. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, not just Israel. It will be preached in all the world for a witness unto, what? All nations. And when it's reached all the nations, then what? the end will come. Now, I've had missionary friends, bless their hearts, they mean well, but they use this verse to promote present-day missions. Listen, Jesus never expected the church to reach all the nations of the world. He was talking about the 144,000 during the tribulation. They will accomplish it. But now you've got to remember, they don't have to stop and go to language school. They don't have to go and be trained how to reach a particular tribe or tongue or nation because these 144,000 men are going to be supernaturally imbued with those abilities. And so they will. They will penetrate every tongue and tribe and dialect. Now I read here a while back, I think I mentioned in a previous taping, in one area... And I don't remember what part of the world it was, doesn't matter. But in this one area, not all that large, there were 400 dialects. So different that from one end of that area to the other, they could not understand each other. But see, these 144,000 Jews are going to be able to go into every tongue and dialect and preach not the gospel of the grace of God. They're going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom, which means the king is coming. The king is coming. And that's what Jesus and the twelve preached. The king is in our midst. He's offering the kingdom. And what a difference. We don't preach that. We preach and proclaim that Christ died for the sins of the world. He was buried and he rose from the dead. That's the gospel of grace. But the gospel of the kingdom will be picked up again when the tribulation. Now I've got to show you where we get all this. Come back with me to Revelation. Now, this is a far cry from Isaiah, and yet it isn't. It's all tied together, especially prophecy. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, because I have to show you from Scripture how that when we come to the end of the tribulation and there are a scattered group of survivors, that some will be saved and some will still be in unbelief, and God's going to deal with that. But we have to establish that from every corner of the planet, you will have some believers. All right, Revelation 7, verse 9. After they've been sealed, commissioned, 12,000 out of each tribe. 
After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. And look where they come from. All nations, all kindreds, and people, and tongues, that's dialects. See, every dialect imaginable will be reached by these 144,000 Jews, but most of them are going to be martyred the moment their faith is revealed by the forces that are. And so here, in prophecy, they're already in the throne room. They're already in glory, clothed with white robes, palms in their hand. They cried loud boy. But Isaiah doesn't speak of the multitudes that are going to be saved. He speaks of what? A few survivors. But of all the survivors, you're going to have a mix. Some that have never responded to the gospel of the kingdom, but some will have. And so we have to realize that these are flesh and blood people who miraculously have survived, and now they're going to be brought to be examined. Can they go into the kingdom, or will they have to be taken off the earth and go to their doom? Now come back with me again to Matthew, and we'll jump in at chapter 25. Now, don't forget the time element here. We're at the end of the tribulation, followed by Christ's second coming. The earth is going to be renovated, remodeled, regenerated, reconstituted, whatever you want to call it, and is going to be made ready now for this glorious heaven-on-earth kingdom. But you've got to have people. You've got to have people. And you can't have just the nation of Israel. You've got to have all the nations. Now again, should have done this first. Keep your hand in Matthew. I'm sorry. Come back with me again to Revelation. Let, let's pick up why I'm making that point. We have to have flesh and blood people. Revelation. Chapter 19, I think I want now. Chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 7, Revelation 20, verse 7. Now, I'm showing you this to prove that we have to have flesh and blood people coming in the front end of the thousand years, other than Israel. All right, you got it? Revelation 20, verse 7. When the thousand years are expired, or it's run its course, Satan will be loose out of his prison, and will go out and deceive the what? Nations, plural, not just Israel. Nations, which are in the four quarters. And that just means they're around the planet, all of them, including Gog and Magog, who evidently were heading up the rebellion early on and will again. All right, now these nations of people who have come on the scene during the thousand-year reign of Christ, born of human parents, they will follow Satan. Verse 9, Then they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp, camp of the saints about, the beloved city, Jerusalem, the throne city. And then God, of course, will destroy them. All right, so you've got to realize that the thousand-year kingdom rule is going to bring about multitudes of people probably at least as many as we got on the planet right now tonight. Okay, so that's what I established, that we have to have flesh and blood parents of the kingdom economy to bring about these multitudes of people who are still flesh and blood, born with an old Adamic nature that for a thousand years wasn't tempted, and as long as there's no choice, you see, they just do what one thing they have, and that's the king, his glorious, benevolent kingdom. They aren't tempted to sin. They aren't tempted to rebel. And so this is why Satan has to be brought back. He has to give this new generation of people a chance to make a choice. Are they going to stay loyal to the king and his righteousness? Or are they going to fall for materialism and wickedness and follow Satan? Well, the answer, of course, is obvious. All right, so now then back to Matthew 25. 
we're picking this up, the survivors of Isaiah 24, who have come through the tribulation. They have heard the gospel of the kingdom from the 144,000, and they have lived to tell it. Miracle of miracles, they've survived it. But there are also some lost people who have survived. All right, here we are. Matthew 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31. And remember, this is the Lord himself rehearsing it. Now he says, when the Son of Man, speaking of himself, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, which shall be in Jerusalem, Mount Zion. And before him shall be gathered all nations. Now be careful. America won't be there with 300 million people. America will probably be represented by a few thousand at most. England will be represented by some. Australia will be represented. China will be represented. All the nations of the world will simply be represented by survivors. Okay? So all the nations shall be brought before him. Now, the first thing he does is separates. He's going to move the lost off to the left. He's going to move the believers off to the right. Now, remember, this is in in the eternal state, you might say, this is in the realm of the supernatural. And so we cannot try to identify all this with things as we understand. This is in the realm of the supernatural. He will bring them from around the planet. They're going to be brought before him somehow or other where he can judge them. All right? So he's going to divide them as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. Now that's just uh, what's the word? A simile? Is that what you call it when you compare something to something else? I haven't been in English class for a while. But it's just an illustration. These aren't sheep and goats, but it's like a shepherd. And I, certainly you can all picture that. If he's got a flock of goats and sheep all mixed up, and he brings them into the fold, and he wants to maybe uh, shear the wool off the sheep, and not, so what does he do? Well, he separates them. All right, Greg and I are always separating cattle. They either get mixed up or we bring them in for one reason or another. We separate the females from the others. It's not all that hard. All right, so he's using that illustration that like a shepherd sorts his goats away from the sheep and puts the sheep over here. He's going to separate the unbelievers and he's going to put the believers over here. Got the picture? All right. Verse 34, then shall the king, see, he's now ruling from Jerusalem. He's ready to bring in the thousand-year rule and reign. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, the sheep, the believers, come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's why I'm always saying from Genesis all the way up through Scripture, what's it talking about? The kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, this glorious rule of Christ on the earth, see? All right, so now the believing survivors of the Gentile world are told to enter into the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. All right, now, I'm speculating. I can't prove this. But I have to look at these things logically. If we're going to have nations of people at the end of the thousand years from all quarters of the earth, what does that tell you about these people? They're going to have to go back, I feel, to their homeland. Now, that's my idea. Don't, don't come back and say, where do you find it? I, I can't show you from Scripture. I'm just using logic. That if believers have now been brought from England and they have been set apart as believers and promised to go into the kingdom, I think God will send them back to England to become the seed stock of the nation and as well as all the other nations around the world. There will be survivors from everyone. They all go back to their homeland. 
so that over that next thousand years they will bring about nations upon nations of people who will still have their separate nationalities, they'll have their separate languages, and I think that's why the 144,000 are gifted as well to be able to speak all the various languages. All right, now then in the minute we have left, these following verses I have to touch on, otherwise somebody's going to call or write and say, well, now wait a minute, what's all this about? Well, this did not bring about their salvation. It was the proof of it. Their salvation was prompted by their believing the message of the 144,000 that Jesus Christ the King is coming. And they believed it, even though their life was in danger. All right, so consequently... Jesus is speaking on behalf of those 144,000 Jews. And he says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. He's referring to the, to the missionaries, the event of the 144,000. And he says, you were, uh, I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison, you came. And then these believers will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry? We've never seen you. But now he gives the reason. Inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. So these believers, during those final hours of the tribulation, actually laid their own life on the line on behalf of these Jewish evangelists. Then he comes into the other group, and the unbelievers who probably had the same opportunity, they had heard the 144,000 preaching, but they reject it, they probably scoffed it, and now look at verse 41. Then shall he also say to them on the left, the unbelieving element, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And how could the Lord say something like that? Because they proved their rebellion, they proved their hatred for things righteous by paying no attention to these 144,000 who no doubt had to suffer privation for the sake of taking this gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Now, this is a good illustration of what the Apostle Paul went through when he rehearses his sufferings in 2 Corinthians 11. What did he do? He was in prison off. He was hungry. He was cold. He was naked. Well, that's just part and parcel of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. But remember... From Isaiah 24, you go right into the kingdom. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.